Outrocast. Day going fine so far, aside from having to talk to this guy in New York. Good day for you? Yeah, every day is an adventure to me when I get up and go to work. And you walk sure. in and there's a chaos with a capital K. So, but uh, I got it done. I'm back home. I'm on my computer. We're good. <laughs> So I was really struck by the pitch that I got on your show because I didn't know that you had a podcast in the works. I knew about the book. I've been to your fine, fine, wonderful restaurant. I respect all the lineage. But you said in something in there that if we don't document the history of what's going on and what's happened, it get lost forever. So I really commend the fact that you were documenting GNR because if you don't, how many other people have these stories that you do? Uh, well, no one had, no, really, there's a few photos that are out there, but as far as the stories goes, nobody was really paying attention. Uh, so they were just, you know, moving on, getting to the next gig, doing whatever, struggling, whatever. But I knew that it was like a Led Zeppelin, you know, it's because every song they came up with was just ready to go on a record, you know? I know the Beatles just put out this, uh, I guess it's the White Album anniversary and there's like 26 cuts of this and takes of that. Yeah. And you listen to that and it's really interesting because it sounds nothing like what you hear on the record. It's completely mm -hmm. different. So it goes to show you, yes, the songs were there, but George Martin really stepped up and like knew exactly what to do with that and how to direct it and how, to, how it should sound. And it came out, you know, it was a masterpiece. Everything they did was a masterpiece, but with GNR, they were doing that the first the first time the song came out. The first, you know, July twentieth, nineteen eighty five, they debuted "Welcome to the Jungle." It sounds just like it does on the record, even the guitar solo. So it, it, it's uh, it's not like they had some, some abilities, and you know, maybe they're going to make it, maybe they're not. I knew for a fact that they were going to make it. And uh, I didn't know how big they would make it, but I, I knew that they were gonna, you know, put something on a record and it would get out. So it was important to document that stuff because why not? And anyways, even if it wasn't important, it was, why would I let it go? Why, why would I not keep the flyer and the ticket stub? And why wouldn't I record the show? Because if I enjoyed it that night, why can't I enjoy it in my car the next day listening to it? So. Sure. That's that I knew what I was doing. Yeah. And a lot of my favorite bands, one thing that they have in common is that the band does almost nothing to promote the great early days of the group. So Guns N' Roses, there's been some interesting things over the years, but most of them came from you, in my opinion. For Van Halen, very little has gotten out. For ACDC, very little that nothing has gotten out. So if people like you don't help document these things, then they, they remain rumors or secondhand stories rather than actual photographs and or audio. So thank you. <laughs> well, I, I, you're not, well, I mean, I guess you could thank me, but it's still, I, I, I'm glad that, you, that you're enjoying it because that's what gives me pleasure to know that somebody else could have these, you know, they could be that fly on the wall and they could, they could, get some of this and piece it together and it, it just you know it makes me feel good it's like it's doing a good deed it 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 it, it, it just I don't know it's it's the ultimate it's the ultimate reward is having somebody you know like what you did what you what you captured or what you did or what you told them you know that, that's a great story blah 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 so it gives them pleasure because music really you know Music is very, it's, it's a huge influence in everyone's life one way or the other, whether you heard something and you then you learned how to play an instrument and, and that's what you're doing for a living. Or if you just use it in your life to deal with stress and deal with enjoy, you know, for excitement or it, if it makes you happy. And sometimes you just wanna know a little bit more uh, than just how, you know, just listening to the music. Especially when you have a band like Guns N' Roses that we're probably one of the last, actually probably was the last band to actually have an, an image, a poster that, I mean, when I, I remember being a kid, you'd go to Westwood and you, you'd come back on that Friday or Saturday night with a poster from the poster shop because, you know, of like Black Sabbath or Led Zeppelin or somebody, you know, ACDC, something, Aerosmith, something you wanted to put on your wall because you could identify the images that, that it, it, you know, made you feel good. 
Guns N' Roses has the sound, they have the guitar playing, they have the songwriting, they have the vocal range. They, they, they just, it just, there's so many elements to it where other bands you only have, you know, they don't, might not have the, an image, like take Muse, for example. Mm -hmm. Love the songs, go to the concert, fall asleep. So, so you know, if that's, I love to hear it in the radio, but I'm not going to their show. So it, Guns N' Roses was the last of those bands that you could identify all the members in the band, you know, and, and all the members in the band had a, had a, a you know, an, a, a very big influence on what the record sounded like, what they put out. So, you know, you can't even add up their value and come up with 100%. Because if you start dividing up, well, let's say Axel should be worth half because, you know, he's the front man. Well, but look at Slash, look at those guitar solos, look at that song, well, look at Izzy. So by the time you allocate 40% to this one and 40% to that one and 50% to that one and 30% to that one and 25% to that one, you're coming up with like 200%. So it, it, it just, it's just like, you know, usually when you put five chefs in the kitchen, they kill each other. But in this case, they came up with some really good recipes, we'll, say, we'll call it. <laughs> but to the credit of you and your family, the Kibitz Room, Guns N' Roses is not the only associated act with Cantors. I didn't realize until I read the book, Nothing But A Good Time, that the Wallflowers kind of got their start playing the Kibitz Room. Uh, rumors that the Red Hat Chili Peppers, Lenny Kravitz, The Doors, Zappa, a lot of people did early gigs in their career as well. So that's just decades around being around seminal rock artists. Well, okay, so you were right about some of those. The other ones hung out there, but they didn't actually play there. The Doors never played there. Uh, Frank Zappa never played there, although he probably ate there every day. Actually, yeah, there's but... a story about Frank Zappa. He comes with a bunch of people, start a table, and then the revolving door of musicians would come and, oh, okay, hang out at Frank Zappa's table. And then at some point, Frank Zappa would go home, but the table would continue because more people, you know, it's like 12 people there, you know, and, and just people kept coming in and, okay, we'll sit here then in this corner. And then Frank would come the next day and the table would still be going sometimes. <laughs> so that, that's the, you know, that's the history. Well, Canners, because of course we were open 24 hours and yeah. Neil Young actually, I read in Rolling Stone magazine that um, in 1966, he drove here looking for, believe it or not, Stephen Stills, because he had met Stephen Stills in Canada somewhere, you know, on the street. And I guess they talked and they had a good conversation. And if you ever get to LA, look me up, blah, blah, blah. So sure enough, he got in his hearse, got to LA, couldn't find Stephen Stills. But what he did for a living was he was our Uber driver. <laughs> he, he actually... Uh, uh, taxi patrons from the Sunset Strip to Canners and back and forth for a dollar a ride. And he did that until he could get enough money in his pocket. And he was like literally heading down to San Francisco to try to get something going. And literally on the street, he, he bumped into Stephen Stills again and decided to stick around. And that became Buffalo Springfield. So wow, th that's just one story. I can go on for, for you know, this, the, from 64 to say 69, what the, what happened, what took place at Canners for, you know, rock and roll was basically every, you know, not only rock and roll, but, you know, the, the whole film industry, anyone that, that uh, you know, worked on movies at Paramount or wherever they were making movies, um, they end up at Canners at some point in the night because what was open, really two or three places. So, right. and the food was good. It's not just, it wasn't by default. It was, they came for, you know, a, a good, it's comfort food. A, a bowl of matzo ball soup, a pastrami sandwich. A, you could get breakfast 24 hours a day. So, and we were, we had the capacity to, to really hold a lot of people. So, and of course, uh, hippies were allowed. <laughs> <laughs> and I've read that, David Lee Roth gave the, this is how the music business works, talk to Vince Neil at Cantor's. Any confirmation of that? Oh, well, I, I, I've seen David Lee Roth a hundred times at Cantor's. He used to live uh, at the Empire West Hotel. Uh, I guess the Empire West is a condo off uh, Alta Loma and, and Holloway or whatever, right near the Sunset Marquee. And I guess when he was living there, he just, you know, came to Cantor's all the time. I, and he'd come by himself. But I, I didn't see him with Vince Neil. But I did see the guys from Motley Crue before they were, you know, before they were making records. I did see them because it looked like Halloween, <laughs> the way they they come in. My my hunch would be that David Lee Roth 
was coming in so often because they're so close to crazy girls. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of history of that at, at them, but yeah. I mean, but that's that's there is a lot of history in Canners, and the fact that Guns N' Roses took their first, you know, actual photo shoot at Canners, and then it that photo turned out to be you can look in their eyes and that photo around the booth at Canners where you could it's on the cover of the Reckless Road book mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you could just see that they just came back literally that day from Hell Tour, which. You know, Seattle, yeah. there to get back and they were hungry and tired, but they knew that they had something and they knew that they were, you know, that kind of solidified that the, not only were they fit musicians, but they kind of like suffered a little bit together. So, you know, they became, there was a bond made out of that trip. And you could see the look in their eyes. If you look at each one of them, they know, you know, they're taking a photo for a flyer that was going to be at the Stardust Ballroom in a couple of weeks. Uh, they were the bottom of the bill and uh, they had to sell 50 tickets to get to do that at six dollars a ticket. <laughs> um, I remember Slash had a way of you know calling people and say hey, you want to go to the show? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, there's a one catch. You have to buy six tickets. That wasn't really the catch, but that was the way of, you know, find four other people to go kind of thing, but spread the word. But so, you know, everyone had a hustle to, to, to make that happen. Um, but it, it was to me, it was just watching watching the songwriting process, watching them, you know, live together basically in the little studio behind Guitar Center, or at least four of them lived there. Um, I think Duff was the only one that used to live with a girlfriend. The rest of them kind of, you know, either they lived there if they struck out, meaning they didn't find somebody to sleep at their house or in the back of someone's car. I actually remember a story Axel was telling me when he was working at Tower Video. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, he, he was basically, he was homeless, but, he would sleep on someone's couch or, you know, on the back of someone's car, not his car. He didn't have a car, but he said his goal was he was setting the goal in 1984 to be able to get a membership to a gym. So no matter where he slept, and sometimes it was on the stairwell in the back of Tower Records that he struck out, uh, is to have a gym so he could shower. And that was all he cared about is, you know, having a place to shower didn't matter where he slept. But that, that was the bar. The bar was set at getting a gym membership. So that after that, the bar moved on and moved on and moved on. And, and you know, they surpassed, they hit those, they hit those goals left and right. And, but there's just, you know, I see things and I remember things and they just stick in me. So I can remember a lot of that stuff. So it's just like it or not, I have it. So why not? Why not, you know, 300 years from now, I just picked a number, but <laughs> we're, we're all going to be gone, but certain music is still going to be around. You're going to always hear, you know, the Beatles and the Stones and Zeppelin and, you know, Guns N' Roses. And there's a, there's a lot of those bands, but Guns N' Roses is one of those bands that when those kids turn 14, 15 years old, they're going to be listening to that. And at sporting events, uh, they'll be playing, you know, Welcome to the Jungle or whatever theme that, you know, whatever they, yeah. those, some of those themes. So it's going to be around long after we're gone. So it might as well, you know, with today's work technology. And that's why we, we started first 50 gigs is, is the podcast. Cause originally we wanted to do a documentary at the same time in 2007, when we put out reckless road, mm -hmm. and, um, it just, we couldn't get the, you know, the band wasn't all on the same page. We couldn't get, uh, you know, the, the sync rights to, to do it properly, you know, yeah. now with this kind of platform, and I, I think the technology has been here even before COVID, but COVID kind of like, you know, zoomed everything up about a seven, eight years into the future of how people communicate and, and, you know, what can be done through a podcast or, you know, we had podcasts before that, but somehow they just got better. Yeah. And we realized that, you know, there was a handful of people we couldn't track down when we were putting together Reckless Road. And just because the internet wasn't as powerful as it was. And now we, you know, we relocated, say Rob Gardner, who is the, dr the original drummer of, of LA Guns and Guns N' Roses. Yeah. And so we missed him right after the book came out, we found him. And, you know, he just missed that window. But, there, you know, there's, like, there's a, a couple other people that we found too. So it's kind of, um, it's a way of getting uh, this documentary, but in, in the form of a podcast where you could have so much, fun with it and you can you know you can put b-roll photos and some video footage and 
uh, you know, the talking them talking to the crowd. Hey, this is the new one. We just wrote it today. Uh, it's not much, but it's the best I could do. This song is for Barbie. This song is called Rocket Queen. So you know, you're going to hear that. You're going to hear Axel talking to the crowd, and you're going to you get goosebumps knowing that hey, that was the first time that song was played. So you know, and how did the crowd react to that? And honestly, I heard them rehearsing it before that, but I didn't hear the vocals. So I just got the, you know, the, the instrumental part of it. But that night I was as shocked as everyone else, you know, hearing that that beautiful song being put together like that. And and believe it or not, it's the same as it sounds on the album as it did that night. So, it, you know, right down to every guitar solo and everything. So the thing about Slash is the first time he hears that, melody in his head he'll come up with something something will come out of his you know out of his soul and it will go into the song and if it fits it's kept how does he remember it i have no idea because most people have to like you know they might rip one out but they've recorded it and then they could like almost relearn it slash it doesn't matter he just he knew what he wanted to do and that's what came out it's like it's you know it's just feel better yeah just done in the first take and that's it. And it, 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 he hit it, you know? So, you know, that's the same thing when they recorded the record, pretty things, you know, things were done in one take unless there was literally a mistake missed or, you know, or I remember one time Slash was actually putting the lead down in You're Crazy mm -hmm. and had like 12 bracelets on his arm and he was playing it. He didn't make a mistake. The solo was fine, but I guess the bracelets kind of, you heard them in the background, maybe touching the guitar a certain way or whatever. And I remember Mike Klink, who was producing it, said, why don't you do that again? Uh, I heard something, you know, or whatever. I remember he, he, something didn't sound right there. And I knew what it was. I saw it, it was the bracelet. So I said, take the bracelets off, don't be an idiot. Nope, nope, nope. So he took the challenge and what he did was he just twisted his, his it was his picking hand. He, 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 he turned it so the bracelets wouldn't touch the guitar. And when you know get that little extra sound that you don't want so it's a useless story but it's just it happened i saw it so i'm reporting it so there's i'm like an excite an encyclopedia of that stuff so i remember everything and i'm just trying to you know put together i was there i documented it reckless road was only half of what we start, planned to do at that time and so here we are, you know, fast forward, what, 12, 13 years later, actually it's 14 years now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the thing about Reckless Road, it actually started in 1993. It took me 15 months to put it together, five hours, four to five hours a day, and uh, probably about $17,000 of my, of my own money. And I designed it on artboards and I didn't use the computer. I printed out photos at labs and I cut them down to the size I thought I wanted. Some photos I'd cut, you know, I'd make them three or four sizes just because I wasn't sure what size I want. So it was just a lot of moving things around. And uh, so it didn't come out then because in the, in the end of 1994, the band kind of fell apart. Yeah. Uh, the, the, my publisher, not my publisher, my uh, agent wanted like an advance, you know, 50 grand or 75 grand or whatever. I didn't care because an advance doesn't mean anything. It just means they're giving you money now instead of later. So what's the yeah. difference? When you get a bad bank loan. <laughs> I have faith in the book and yeah. you put the book out. And when it sells, you'll pay me. I, right now, let's just get the book out. But I guess they work on commission. I don't know, whatever. But they wanted you know big money for it. And uh, nobody wanted to pay that money because there was no record inside. And they like to release things with a record. And so the book kind of just sat for like you know a long time from 94 until I met Jason Porath, who was my co-author and also really the one driving this whole First 50 Gigs a podcast and directing it and, and, and masterminding it. Sure, I have the information, but he's organizing in a way that I, I just, I just, you couldn't do it without him. But it, anyways, um, you know, I met him in 2006 and he was, he was working for a company called Enhanced Books and they were, they put out a, or they, there was a book about Cantor's actually, America's Greatest Deli. It wasn't about Cantor's, but Cantor's was in it, mm -hmm. a chapter. And um, they sent him down to videotape my family members because they were doing this platform online to get like a little, you get the book, plus you get some extra content. And the extra content is us talking about the history of Cantor's. 
And I, when, he, when I realized what they were doing, I said, you know, I put together a Guns N' Roses book and I have a lot of toys, if I say toys, a treasure, a treasure trap, uh, chest of, of, you know, audio, video, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. all this stuff, memorabilia. And if I ever get my book out, I, you know, we should be working together. And so he says, well, I'll, think, I'll see if I could find anyone, you know, to help, you know, finance this. And like three, four months later, he called me, you still want to do the book? I said, of course, I didn't put it out. I didn't work all that, put all that work in for nothing. Right. But don't know about this and they should know about it. So anyways, um, he helped me get it out independently through independent publisher and a lot went wrong. <laughs> Not going to get into it, but a lot went wrong with that. Um, and, but we still have the book. We, you know, still I'm still actually believe it or not, I'm sitting on fifty thousand copies, <laughs> which you can purchase. They printed, they printed, they printed, yeah, they printed a hundred thousand copies, but they had no means to promote it. So sure, they would have sold if everyone knew about it, but because they had no means to promote it, you didn't know about it. And like uh, like Barnes and Nobles, they'd carry one copy, and then when it sold. Uh, you know, two or three weeks later, they would replace it with one copy. And if somebody <laughs> stole it off the shelf, they would never replace it because their inventory says they have it. So no matter what we did, it, we just couldn't get it. We, 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 we struck out with it. But everyone that sees it or flips through it or buys it every time. So yeah. it, it, it's, it's, it's a great book. And, and I know it is. And, and um, this is just another form uh, of, you know, um, to the next level mm -hmm. of, of, of getting the information out, which is a whole new dimension and it's it's fun. Is there a second band that you've documented any to any level like you have Guns N' Roses? <laughs> well, of course, when my son was in bands, I documented them the same way, you know, because I, every show I was at, of course, I, I videotaped. I didn't have to take pictures because all their girlfriends and whatever were taking pictures. So what's the point? The pictures are gonna come. But uh, the videotape I thought was important and saving the flyer and, you know, that stuff was important. But, you know, th those bands fell apart and whatever, and they, they never went anywhere. But the differences with Guns N' Roses was uh, I grew up with Slash and I knew him since we were, you know, we were best friends when we were 11. And I knew that he was different. I knew how he dressed. I knew how he looked. I knew just something was superhuman about him. And his actually the, the first clue was his artwork. You know, he was drawing beautiful photos of, you know, an art class of dinosaurs in the jungle and snakes crawling through the trees and the dinosaur would have like a dimple. And, it, you know, it, he didn't trace this out of a book. It just came out of his brain. You know, I saw him actually do this on the, on the yard uh, because it was due and he didn't do his homework and he just knocked this out in like, you know, 10 minutes. But uh, so you knew that, wow, look at this guy. This guy could work for Disney when he grows up uh, or something, you know. Mm -hmm. That was the first clue, but like two, three years later, we started riding bikes, you know, BMX bikes. And that was the second clue that every, he did things 10 times better than anyone else. He was faster. He won all his races. He flew off the jumps with style. And it's just, you knew that if, it, 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 you know, you put your money on him, you're going to win. So, you know, then we lost touch in it for about a year because he got kicked out of the, the junior high that I was going to, and he went to another school. So, you know, we just kind of lost touch for about a year or so. Uh, and then we met back up in summer school at the next school. And uh, it was actually at Beverly Hills High. He wasn't even going to go there for the 10th grade. He was going to go to Fairfax. But his mom enrolled him for that summer program. And I actually was going to Beverly for high school. So we bumped into each other uh, as, as we were leaving. And we caught up. I'm wearing an Aerosmith shirt. He was wearing a Zeppelin shirt. We weren't even listening to music when we were hanging out before that. So that that whole year, you know, I got into music, he got into music, he started playing guitar. So I didn't actually know him at the, I mean, knew him, but I wasn't hanging out with him when he first picked up his guitar. But I bumped into him maybe six or seven months into it. And he was in the band Titus Sloan. And I knew the drummer. I went to grammar school, uh, junior high with the drummer. But Mm -hmm. So he said, yeah, I, I, he told me them Adam Greenberg and Ronnie Schneider. And, 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 I, and I said, OK, I said, I knew it right then and there. I went with him that day to rehearsal. And sure enough, when they opened that garage and he plugged his little uh, uh, Beastie Rich Mockingbird into that Sun Amp and they were playing like, you know, Black Sabbath, uh, Heaven and Hell. And it was so heavy and so thick. And the guitar sound was so rich and the tone and then they, you know, they were they were doing a couple originals, and then they did some blues jams, and 
you know, I was getting goosebumps on the on, on the blues jams because he was improvising, and I just it was like it was like hearing like Air Clapton or some you know blues guy playing. Sure. And it was just like like someone that had been like playing for fifty years, you know. And and yet he wasn't even he didn't have the skill set the skill set to fly around the guitar. He just knew whatever he hit, it got you. You know, you you felt it in your spine. So right away, of course, every time there were, I was even recording rehearsals because I knew it was good. But um, of course, every party I, re I would record and and um, you know keep the flyer. Why why wouldn't I? So that's where it all started. But you know, he, he made his journey through different bands and eventually, well, he, he met Axel twice really because after, when they first started, you know, work, when he st first started working with Axel, it was in Hollywood Rose. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to see, Slash and I and Steven Adler actually went to see Hollywood Rose at Gazzari's. It was the Battle of the Bands. It was like a dollar to get in. And it was only three songs, but we knew that uh, we, had ha we had their demo tape and uh, Slash had bumped into Izzy actually, because Izzy was looking for, believe it or not, a drawing that Slash made an Aerosmith drawing. And Slash was working at uh, the guitar store on, it was called uh, Hollywood Music. It was where Genghis Cohn is now. Uh, coincidentally about uh, a hundred feet of for him when he, where he used to work at Centerfold Newsstand on Melrose and Fairfax. Hmm. Anyways, long story short, somehow Slash had that demo. Maybe Izzy gave it to him, I'm not sure exactly how he got it, but he got a hold of it. And uh, we, we could hear that Axel was really good and we heard Anything Goes. I think Shadow Your Love might've been on there too, but Anything Goes is what caught me. And uh, so we went to see them and you know, like I said, Steven and Slash were looking for a band to join or looking for a singer and, and, you know, and, and a bass player to join their band, um, either way. And so we went to see Rose and, and you know, we were all kind of blown away by what we saw. And Izzy was kind of running around and there was a lot of stage presence. And, that night they met up after the after the gig at Gazari's, and then the next day Axel was you know at at uh, Slash's grandmother's house where he used to live in the basement, and you know within an hour Slash Slash and Stephen were in the band, and so that's you know but that didn't work because Stephen had double bass drums, and I mean it worked for about three months but it was loud it was fast you knew there was something there but it, it just it, you know. It, you knew it was it was the best thing that I had seen so far, but those two working together, but it was nothing like what we got a year later. Uh, that fell apart. Axel joined LA Guns, which was Tracy, uh, Tracy Guns was Slash's rival all the way through junior high school and high school. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's like now Axel's, you know, working with them. And when they asked me to take some, Axel called me and asked me to take some pictures of LA Guns. I felt like I was the train slash because I'm helping that, you know, he's asking me to do it. I'm not just doing it on my own. Yeah. But me and Axel were friends. I just didn't know what he was up to. I was really growing up with Slash. And so Slash is who I stuck with. But Axel, when they split up, I didn't really see Axel for a while until he called me. So anyways, long story short, LA Guns, of course, fell apart. Well, I shouldn't say they fell apart. Axel left LA Guns after a couple of the shows. Early incarnation fell apart. Yes. Right, right. And then, you know, they might have had a new singer. And then, you know, basically, I, I, I believe that, you know, they were, it maybe Axel was about to go back to Indiana or Izzy was about to go back to Indiana. I forgot which one, but they were about to just, one of them was about to throw in the towel. And uh, they decided to, at the, the 11th hour, to, maybe start a side project mm -hmm. where Axel's not in charge and Tracy's not in charge because if, 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 if you join, if Tra Tracy were to join Hollywood Rose, it would be Axel's band. And if Axel were to join LA Guns, it would be LA Gun it would Tracy's band. So rather than them, you know, two leaders fighting for control of how the songs are gonna sound or what they're gonna write about or whatever, it, it, it became, well, why don't we do this to, uh, like a safety? Why don't we start a side project? And that way it will just be both of our bands and we can still have our own bands, but this will be a side project we do together. So that's how it really started. But of course, after you know, a very short time, the bass player quit and they, they found Duff. And you know, we, we already knew Duff because Duff had answered an ad for Slash and Steven for Road Crew and was hung around for about four or five days and then he split because there, he saw there wasn't there wasn't a singer and it really wasn't going anywhere. 
And, uh, you know, it was just like, a, okay, maybe we'll meet up again someday. It was a friendly, you know, thing. But Duff was living across from where Axel and Izzy were staying. So somehow they said they keep, they know he's a musician. They see him with equipment. Hey, what do you play? Actually, Duff was a guitar player, but he could play bass too. Oh, we need a, a bass player. Okay, I'll play bass. So he joins the band. They're trying to go to, you know, Seattle. They're going, uh, Duff booked a small tour to Seattle and Portland and a few other places. And uh, Tracy and Rob were like, mm. they were fight. First of all, Axel was fighting with Tracy about some songwriting or songs. And at the same time, they didn't really want to go on that tour. They, were, they didn't think it was stable. They didn't know how they were going to get there. And it turned out they were right. It wasn't very stable. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, Duff and Izzy and, and, and Axel, they didn't care. They, sleep on the sidewalk they'll make it work you know and so they went to tower video and and where slash was working said okay so we got a gig at the troubadour in a couple of days and then we got this tour uh we lost tracy and rob uh how, are you and steven in and slash had just joined black sheep which was a heavy metal band not exactly what slash's taste was for but slash was a good enough guitar player to pull it off and uh he played one gig with them and then he quit. And it was at that gig, Tracy, and, and not Tracy, but um, Izzy and, and Axel showed up and they were like, come on, man, you got to do it. You got to do it. And so Slash quit Black Sheep, joined them, played the Troubadour gig and the rest is history. And, you know, that, that, was, that, that solidified the Appetite for Destruction lineup. And what made it really work this time was well, there's two different stories. If you ask Steven, he'll say one of his bass drums wasn't working, so he just played single bass drum. But if you ask Izzy and Duff, they'll tell you when Steven went to smoke a cigarette, they decided to hide one of his bass drums because, or, you know, like really hide it, not like, you know, not like put it like, you know, in the next room. They like took it a block away and hit it. Uh, and then, wow, here I am, I get to this gig and I didn't watch them rehearse. But I get to that gig at June 6, 1985 at the Troubadour. And um, I, I shot four, four rolls of film. And when you're shooting pictures, you're, you're, it's hard to really know what you're hearing sometimes. You know, yes, mm -hmm. I knew the songs. They played them, in, some of them in Hollywood Rose. There was, you know, covers, Jumping Jack Flash, you know, Heartbreak Hotel. You know those songs anyways. But um, while I'm taking these pictures, I'm thinking, wow, this is different. This, you know, now Izzy's in the band. Izzy was not in the band when Slash was there. He had just literally quit and, and joined London. And, um, it, it, you know, now Izzy's there. And I knew Izzy was a songwriter because I, I had seen Izzy and Tracy hanging out at Canners, writing the songs on the counter. And, you know, he had that little Hanoi Rocks look and feel to him. And, right. you know, and there was a lot of people saying, well, yeah, he, he helped set the style and whatever. So Izzy was the cool one in the band. And... You know, he wasn't a great guitar player, but he was a great stage performer and he was a good starter. He could he could start a song and, you know, between Slash and him, they would work on each other and this, you'd get a song out of it. But um, anyways, it, it just, the thing that really made it work was a single bass drum because all of a sudden there was a groove that you never heard before. Now you could hear Axel. Before, you could barely hear Axel. It was just drowned up. It was like Cozy Powell you know, uh, on Rainbow Rising, right right through the whole, you know, set. And now all of a sudden, everything is just, wow, what is going on here? And they all look good and they all sound good. And eh, there was maybe like 50 people in the audience, mostly their girlfriends or, you know, me and those kinds of people. Right. Um, well, you had but, to buy six tickets, so. Well, for that, not for that Troubadour, <laughs> that Troubadour gig, they gave you tickets that were like $2 off, you know, to get in or whatever. Yeah but you didn't have to buy the tickets. It, for whatever reason, the Troubadour didn't do that at that time, you know? And uh, they would just set up three bands that they thought were matched and hopefully there'd be a, a good crowd. But needless to say, every time they played, uh, their audience doubled because word of mouth got out. And, you know, and it, it just, it was, you know, then we started placing ads uh, in BAM Magazine, quarter page ads. And then at some point we put full page ads and that just, helped i mean i think it was going to happen anyways because the word of mouth was spreading but then when some people see like a full page ad they know that costs like 1200 bucks and so somebody let's go see what this is so you know someone placed 1200 bucks to this magazine 
uh, for this ad. Let something's going on. Let's go see who that band is. So it, it brought a lot of a you know brought a, a few extra people, brought some record company interests, and it, you know it worked. So Did that's. You do you have time for one quick topic or question? Then you're a free man. If not, we'll I take have all, part the, here. all the time in the world. Okay. So one of the things that people talk about with Slash all the time is the fact that he was almost in the band Poison. Now, were you in his life around that period of time? And in turn, do you have early documentation of Poison as well? Okay, so here's the thing about Poison. When Poison first got to Los Angeles, it came from Pennsylvania. Yes. That actually opened for Kiss, believe it or not, is somewhere in that area. So they, 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 were, they had something going there, but they knew they weren't gonna make it there. That was a, Kiss was a one-time thing. So they came here, they moved here to try to really, you know, where the record companies are and get it going. Their first gig they saw was at Madame Wong's West. Mm -hmm. Guess who it was? It was Hollywood Rose. So they, th there's a, that's the first connection. Now, Matt Smith was the guitar player from Poison. Yes. And him and his Rudy, uh, Rody, Rody Paul right away recognized that Slash was, you know, had something special. That was just a hello. They, they, that was the first time they crossed paths. Then they, they gigged together at the Troubadour, not, not, not while, you know, uh, Poison had a higher up lineup on the gig, like Vicki Hamilton got them a, you know, a middle place or maybe a headliner spot. And uh, Hollywood Rose was the opener. And I have a feeling that Poison requested Hollywood Rose to come open for them. I, I, I can't confirm that, but that was my gut feeling. Uh, so anyways, that's, that's the first time I saw Poison. And we were hanging out and Matt Smith and Paul, because I was an Aerosmith collector and so were them, we hit it off and they'd come to my house and we'd, we'd play with my Aerosmith toys. <laughs> and, and so, you like that toys in the attic, my arrows. Exactly, right? yes. So there, there was a connection there. So of course, when Matt got his girlfriend pregnant and he was gonna go start a family, you know, poison meant a lot to him. He didn't just quit because he didn't wanna play with them anymore. He quit for to start a family. So it, it was in his best interest to, to really, you know, it's like someone's dying of cancer and they wanna fix their spouse up with, to make sure they're not alone, you know, like, so he's looking for the perfect replacement for Poison, of course, his number one pick, and Paul, the roadie, was Slash, and uh, Slash didn't really want to even go to the audition, because he knew it was bubblegum rock, and he knew that, you know, they, they squirt silly string all over the place, hi, my name is Slash, and they all introduced themselves, and that's not Slash, you know, Slash wants to lean back and do it with his moccasins, and do his thing, and, and yeah. not squirt, not going to the microphone and start talking, hi, I'm Slash, so anyways, I said, you got to be crazy. You have to do it. They're selling out the Troubadour. They're going to have a record contract. I even if you don't stay in the van, it's a stepping stone. So of course, he wasn't in Guns N' Roses. Of course, I wouldn't tell him to leave Guns N' Roses to join Poison. Slash was doing nothing at the time, nothing. So what do you got to lose? You're doing nothing. So join Poison, see what happens. So somebody will find you. You'll get plucked out of there. Of course, you're not going to stay in Poison. But anyways, I made him go to the audition, but I didn't go with him. And uh, he went and he kind of, I think he fumbled it on purpose. He, you know, but there's some cool stories. We, we had uh, Paul, we tried to get Matt, but we missed him uh, because of conflicts. But uh, we got Paul, Paul basically told the story and it, you'll find it in the podcast when we get there, but of how that rehearsal, I mean, how that audition went. And they still wanted Slash, of course, but I think, well, in the end, CC got the job. Uh, and Slash claims he saw CC at, like CC's audition was right after his. So he saw CC. But if you want to hear something real quick, I'll tell you a funny story. Please, please. Us. You're the oh, one with the great stories. I got all the time for you. <laughs> Guess what? Slash doesn't even remember this. And it's a big event, a very big event. Okay. So 1982-ish, when, when uh, uh, Ace Freely left Kiss and nobody knew about it, Slash, I told you earlier, Slash was working at that guitar store, uh, Hollywood Music, and the yeah. owner, his name was Hero. And of course, when there's not, no one in the shop, what do you think Slash is gonna do? He's gonna plug into an amp and doodle around. So the owner knew that Slash was a real guitar player. He can clearly see this. And he got wind under the, under the table when like nobody knew about it, quiet, quiet, he quietly was told that Kiss was looking for a guitar player. So he said, he recommended Slash for the job. Slash was 17 at the time, so that makes him a minor. 
So there was a phone call set up between Paul Stanley and Slash at business card clocks where Slash used to work for $6 an hour. And uh, I was there. I knew the call was going to come at what you know, whatever, two o'clock or whatever the time was. And so I couldn't hear Paul Stanley, but I could hear Slash's answers. So in the end, they were, yeah, yeah, I could do that. I, yeah, I could pull that out. You know, those were the things Slash was saying. So turned out Paul Stanley was saying, would you be able to tour? Uh, are you worried about staying in school or do you, can you leave school? Are you, you know, is your parents going to be upset? You know, that, those kinds of questions. Can you record? Are you able to, are you good enough to record and get it done without wasting studio time? You know, that kind of stuff. And Slash said, yeah, yeah, I could pull that off. Yeah, 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 yeah. But in the end, it was only a phone interview. Paul Stanley never saw what Slash looked like. He didn't see a photo of him. He didn't hear him play. No demo tapes, no nothing. Now, I think what, what startled Paul Stanley was that Slash was 17 and he just didn't want to take on that liability. I think had, he'd seen like photos of Slash or Slash showed up in an audition and picked up a guitar and started playing it. 100% Slash would have gotten the job instead of Vinnie Vincent. Kiss would have been a better band. Guns N' Roses would have never got off the ground. So there, there's a story. And when I told this story once, while I was doing an interview with Slash, Slash looked at me so confused. He goes, I don't even remember that. Now, how do you not remember that? But, you know, there's enough alcohol and, and, and whatever in his brains to actually, you know, that was just like a little, like a, we're talking about a, a, a one, a, a five minute incident, you know? Now I'm sure if Slash went to an audition, he would never forget that. But because it was just a little interview over the phone, somehow he blocked it out of his mind. Yet the small world nature of it all is Paul Stanley, as the rumor goes, wanted to produce what became Appetite for Destruction. And the rumor was, he said that Welcome to the Jungle did not have a memorable chorus. And he wanted the song, the introduction, or what is the chorus to be the intro of the song to flip it all around. So I'm wondering if he ever connected the dots and went, that kid I spoke with on the phone is that guy. You don't there's think no, so? There's no way Paul Stanley knows that. I saw Paul Stanley at one of the gigs at Raji's. It was I actually remember the day, it was May 13th, 1986, after the band was signed. And yes, Paul, Paul was very interested in producing the band and he wanted to quote unquote, as Slash says, re uh, rewrite uh, Welcome to the Jungle and turn it into a pop song. And see, it didn't, Welcome to the Jungle didn't need any rewriting. In fact, none of the songs needed rewriting as, right. as, as, as the record t shows you. Um, so the only difference thing that happened on Appetite for Destruction was a mistake. When you hear um, uh, Paradise City at the end where the drums go, to, you know, right before the fast yeah. part, it doubles. It got recorded. It got, they recorded it once because that's how the song went. It, it's just one time, but if you listen to the record, it repeats itself two times. And I think it was a mistake. Somehow the, and the engineer made a mistake or was fooling around with it. And they, they just said, leave it alone. They liked it. So, but it wasn't, that was the only thing that got added to that record. But don't get me wrong, Mike Klink wouldn't just sit there and do nothing. Mike Klink really, you know, toned them in and they were wild. They were like wild animals. And, and, and to get them all in one place at the same time, <laughs> people wouldn't show up and Izzy was sleeping in the closet because he had nowhere to live. And it was just a big circus. It was like babysitting a bunch of babies, but a bunch of crazy babies. But, and, and you know, drugs were going back and forth in different directions and it just wasn't, it was a mess, but he was able to control them and capture the beautiful sound because I knew all those songs, of course, but I remember the first time they handed me the cassette and I listened, when I say the cassette, not from Geffen, but like the demo of mm -hmm. after they came back from, you know, recording it, not recording, but mixing it. Um, I put it in a little Walkman and I was just like, my mouth was open. Of course, I knew every note in every song, but, and I watched them record it. But now I'm hearing it and I'm just blown away. And there was some other information I, I could tell you about the mixing. I was told that they mixed it in a way that if you have a shitty little uh, uh, ghetto blaster, yeah, it's still going to sound good. So oh, they yes, yes, I've, I've heard about this. This is 
was it Mike Clink or Tom Worman? One of these producers had this idea of having bad speakers on the wall and then car speakers on the wall and playing the mix through both of them and going, if it sounds good on this, it's going to sound good on that. Was that Clink? I don't remember who did that, but I, I, I just know that it, they, I think they gave it a little bit more treble. So when it, when you're playing it through crappy speakers that it, it still doesn't get, you know, like muffled out or whatever, but yeah. whatever they did, they hit, they hit the nail right on the, they hit the hammer right on the nail and, and you know, it, it's timeless. But there was one other thing that, that makes that record so timeless, not only because it sounds so good and it's because it is so good, but it's because those, that, that, those songs are put together they, they didn't just, it's not like a bunch of fiction, nonfiction, this, uh, what are we going to write about? Hmm. You know, it, they're writing about what happened to them. They're, they're, they're writing about their experiences on the street. And once they, they got their own apartments, right away, the demand, the, 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 the songwriting changed. And not, be, mm -hmm. not for the worse, it certainly didn't change for the worse, but it definitely changed. And the change was, they can't write about the cops chasing them and this and this right. and and, and you know the girlfriend claiming this and whatever and you know all, all the all the all that stuff was the stress of getting to the next gig, surviving the, the you know not getting arrested, it just all that was you know coming down on them, and it gave. I almost wish that they didn't get signed as fast because they might have actually you know at the pace they were going, they were writing songs, just constantly not not trying to write songs. Okay, we got to write a song for the new record. It's not that, it's like they were writing songs because they were influenced in what was going on. And they just, you know, like, like artists do, they, 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 they put that in a form. Mm -hmm. So the form was songs. And, you know, it, Jungle came out and, you know, was debuted at, uh, July 20th, 1985, Rocket Queen, September 20th. So that's two months apart. Uh, Paradise City, October 10th. Uh, then we had, um, we had Night Train, uh, right, uh, December 20th at the Music Machine, and we had Michelle, uh, January 4th at the Troubadour that, you know, 1986, that's like two weeks later. And then, uh, we had Out to Get Me and, uh, you know, the night that Tom Zutat saw them for the first time and wanted to sign them, which was February 28th, 1986. So, None of those songs needed any tweaking. None of them were throwaway songs. When I say none of them, they, they was, there wasn't other songs that just didn't make it to Appetite. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they wrote it, it worked. There was nothing that didn't work. So I almost wish, and of course they wrote songs after they got signed. After they got signed, they put together You're Crazy. They put together Brownstone, Brownstone and Sweet Child came together in the same week. And then you know a couple months later, It's So Easy showed up. But, um, if had they not gotten signed when they did, I almost wish they got signed, say, six months later, we would have had like five more songs, you know, because they, when they got signed, what they wanted to do was take the songs they already had and get it on record. And, you know, Tom Zutat would say, nah, you need a couple more. And, and it just, you know, they had money in their pocket, getting into trouble. So everything started going like it was going to go the whole project looked like it was just, they were gonna die, go to jail, or get dropped by the record company, or all of the above. Like uh, like the Michael Monroe album and song, Sex, Drug, uh, Sex, Jail, or Rock and Roll. Wait, wait, wait. Is it <laughs> Sex, Jail, or Rock and Roll? What's the Michael Monroe song? Oh, no, Dead, Jail, or Rock and Roll. Right, that That's basically, what it is. Yes. rock and roll wasn't even an option. It yeah. was, I, I had a front row seat to this, and I was like, I'm bailing Slash out of jail, literally, because he got pulled over and there was something in his car that shouldn't have been there. But yeah, uh, jail, death, or dropped by the record company. Yeah, there was no. Are they going to make the rock and roll? It didn't look like there was going to be any rock and roll made. They yeah. were just. They were such a nuisance. The record. They were destroying the apartments they were living. They were causing so much chaos that it was insane. It, it, how they survived that. If Tom Zutet wasn't there, they absolutely, absolutely, positively would have been dropped. And the other thing Tom Zutet did was give them the power of uh, uh, of, of having control of of uh, how the songs are arranged and you know uh, that kind of that freedom. Uh, because a lot of record companies don't they don't do that. They give it all to the producer and, and yeah, you could get a hit or miss on that. But in this way, why would you screw with something 
that, you know, Tom was smart enough to see that this was good on its own, give them the freedom, they know what they're doing. You know, a producer can record them and maybe help them a little bit with some things, you know, maybe some, some arrangement somewhere, but at the same, it didn't need like, it didn't need like something from the sixties where a producer came in and did, you know, they were just boss and you know, that kind of stuff. So that, that's, it, it's a really, you know, it, it was a, it was two years. So let's see, it was, well, for me, it was longer than that, but once Guns N' Roses started, we're going to go from their June 6 gig. It was, you know, a year of craziness and then another year of craziness. So <laughs> the second year was crazier than the first year. The first year was fun. The second year was crazy. Uh, but there's, yeah, there's just a lot of good information in the first 50 gigs uh, podcast. And, and, you know, they got to go to first50gigs.com to sign up for it because not something you just like buy on Amazon or. Right. I know that there's, they made different tier rates. It's like $5 a month or something. But you, I forget how many episodes you get, but it's definitely, uh, it's definitely well worth it. And Agreed. the money covers all the producing for it. And you know, a lot of money was spent to put it together. So it's just, just a means of getting, it's, it gives us a, a way of getting this information out there. And, uh, you know, there's, it's, we're, we're having fun with it. We, we have a couple more to record. We already did the first season, but we just have to, to do a couple more just to, to stick in between there. And uh, they're really fun to do, and uh, you know we love it. Outro cast.